the unmissable news stories of the day. This is the Beijing Hour. Examining the events that impact and shape China and the rest of the world. This is the Beijing Hour, one hour of news and information brought to you every weekday. Now here's your host. Shane Bigham with you on this Monday, July 22nd, 2024. You're listening to the Beijing Hour, coming to you live from the Chinese capital. On today's program, CPC General Secretary Xi Jinping explained the importance of a crucial resolution on reform for the country's opening up and modernization. U.S. President Joe Biden's ended his re-election campaign following pressure from within his own party. The head of the Paris 2024 organizing committee says the French capital is ready to host the Summer Olympic Games. In business, China plans further improvements for the digital economy. In sports, Chinese tennis ace Zheng Xinwen has taken a title in Italy. In culture and entertainment, the 2024 Beijing International Beverage Festival is underway. Now checking the day's top stories. The Central Committee of the Communist Party of China has adopted the resolution on further deepening reform comprehensively to advance Chinese modernization. General Secretary Xi Jinping has offered his explanation of this important document. He said the CPC's focus on deepening reform and advancing Chinese modernization was driven by the party's uh, pressing need to achieve accomplishments in the new era. The Chinese leader said it's imperative for Beijing to improve its socialist system with Chinese characteristics and its system and capacity for governance. He added that the country needs to enhance high-quality development and better respond to major risks and challenges. China has released the key document to explain its plans for reform and modernization following the Communist Party of China's crucial meeting last week. These measures cover a wide range of areas, including the economy, people's well-being, security and party governance. The resolution reiterates the importance and necessity of deepening reform. It also stresses the principles of the reform, which include key factors such as CPC leadership, the uh, party's uh, people-centered development approach, innovation and the rule of law. Zhang Chuning walks us through some of the key takeaways. The document starts off with an overview of the significance of carrying out reforms, setting out a target of completing them by 2029, or the 18th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. It then lays out policy directions in various areas. Uh, For example, for the private sector, uh, China says it will focus on building a high-level socialist market economy, adding that new policies and laws will be framed to support private firms when it comes to financing and resource allocation. The readout also mentions that the country will support competing private firms to lead in major technological breakthroughs. So it aims to break down some barriers that hinder competition and create conditions that boost research on key technologies. And regarding the property market, uh, it also outlines the need for a new housing system and a new model for real estate development that promotes both renting and purchasing, adding that the country will will give each city full autonomy in regulating its respective real estate market. And when it comes to government budget, it also outlines a vision to deepen fiscal and taxation reform and improve the budget system, also bringing reforms for investments and operations of state capital. And other policies involving the fiscal relationship between local and central government and policies to address the shrinking population, such as improving maternity leave measures, you know, providing subsidies for having children and boosting childcare services are also mentioned. And there are also other plans of reforms uh, mentioned in the document covering education, social welfare, environmental protection, uh, trade and investment, urban rural and to integration, and so on. So many more exciting changes to expect. And we're really looking forward to more concrete approaches coming out of that. That was Zheng Chuning in Beijing. And for more, Li Dongning spoke with Liu Baocheng, Dean of the Center for International Business Ethics at the University of International Business and Economics, and Einar Tangen, a senior fellow at the Taiha Institute and chairman of Asia Narratives.
First of all, to Aina, the third plenary sessions of each five-year plan in China have always laid out the country's economic and social development goals. So how are the goals in this year's resolution different from the goals of previous third plenary sessions? And also, what do you think have led to those additions? Well, Dunning, it's less about uh, differences and more about fine-tuning. You have a, a lot of things that led to these additions. There are embargoes, especially by the U.S., in terms of technology and blacklisting Chinese champions, slowing global demand due to uncertainties, and advent of digitalization. We're in a world of change, and the Chinese government has to respond to it. It's always been its strong point has always been planning. It's plan, adjust, go forward. Right, and in terms of a uh, macro economic uh, regulation and control, Professor Liu, uh, the resolution also stresses uh, coordinated reforms in the fiscal, tax, uh, financial, and other major sectors. It also mentions to improve the basic uh, public service system and listen to this: strengthen the construction of inclusive, fundamental, and bottom-up livelihood. Very strong adjectives here. Do you think those goals are ambitious? What do you make of the, these goals? Yes.、Uh... Because this is a very complex issue, and、uh, we have seen a、uh, shifting of the pendulum over the years between the division of the tax income、uh, with regard to the central government to local government, and also how to address the number of、uh, tax schemes. So these are there not only. To address the fair distribution of the tax income, but now、uh, we need、uh, better transparency uh, because uh, there has been a lot of additional taxes, additional fees that、uh, that is charged without really integrating into the budgetary and、uh, fiscal system. Now the central government does really want to have a streamlining of those tax scheme, and in the meantime, to give more flexibility to the. Localities, in order to address their customized issues at the local level, and particularly to address the debt issues that is there to plague their further advancement、uh, in the new technology and also in the provision of people's livelihood. Li Dongning was speaking with Liu Baochang of the University of International Business and Economics, and Einar Tangen from the Taihe Institute. Major state-owned enterprises have been working to develop and integrate new quality productive forces as part of their reform drives. A petrochemical company in the northeastern province of Jilin is a prime example.、Uh, Li Shuang went there to find out more. Roaring compressors and towering distillation columns, pipelines full of oil and gas stretch across the site. Jilin Petrochemical Company is one of the largest state-owned petrochemical enterprises in China, and is undergoing major upgrades. Line operator Li Yan has been with the company since 1996. She's witnessed the transformation the China's modernization drive has brought. When I first joined, many valves needed manual adjustment. Now they can be controlled electrically or with steam from the control room. Li explains to me how hydrocarbons from petroleum are heated to over 700 degrees Celsius to crack the molecules. The process is crucial to the production of cleaner burning diesel. At Dilin Petrochemical, Li is a member of an elite group known as highly skilled personnel. She is expected to have a comprehensive understanding of the company's entire production chain and the connections between upstream and downstream operations. In the past, our focus was solely on completing our own tasks. Now we must also understand how to optimize workflow through data analysis to foster high-quality development. The blueprint for development and reform outlined by China's top leadership is conveyed to frontline workers. New material specialist Lu Shulai says the future of oil lies in chemicals rather than fuel. Jilin Petrochemical is investing in ABS, a resilient resin suitable for widespread use, ranging from food packaging to ammunition depots. You are looking at the construction site of our new plant. It's scheduled to start production next September. At that point, Jilin Petrochemical will achieve an annual output of 1.8 million tons of ABS, ranking among the top three producers worldwide. 
Lu as the Chinese government instruction to develop new quality productive forces sets a go and direction for the company. Our research and development of ABS amplifies the innovation advocated by President Xi. Through scientific research and technological breakthroughs, we have enhanced our products. That's how we promote new quality productive forces. He dismisses the notion of petrochemicals as a sunset industry. A long history doesn't imply a lack of dynamism or a future. Without materials as a foundation, developing new industries like 5G technology and electric vehicles will be challenging. As a state-owned enterprise celebrating its 70th anniversary, Dilin Petrochemical is investing in talent and technology while balancing the need for eco-friendly development and growth. That was Li Shuang on industrial transformation in northeast China. In the past 13 years, 23 mainland cities have followed Shanghai, Beijing, and Guangzhou in achieving annual GDP of more than a trillion yuan, or roughly 138 billion U.S. dollars. That includes central western cities such as Chongqing and Wuhan, and many non-provincial capitals like Qingdao and Suzhou. Wuxi in the wealthy Yangtze River Delta region is one of them, with the history of more than 3,000 years. The eastern city boasts profound cultural heritage and beautiful natural scenery. It's also home to a variety of industries ranging from manufacturing to the digital economy. Artificial intelligence is now a key force fueling the growth of traditional and emerging sectors in the city. Guest Turi Manikam finds out more. A future that young minds dream about. A reality that is happening in China's Jiangsu province. This eastern Chinese city of Wuxi is trying to go above and beyond. It has an ambitious plan and powers industries with new quality productive forces. One of these is artificial intelligence. Invisible to the human eye, but AI can accurately detect diseases. Other tangible benefits include better patient care and cost savings. But does one size fits all? I think the next level of AI for, for medicine would be um, personalized medicine. Because I see a lot of hope that AI can be used to advance the medical field in different ways uh, in the future. Not just for the patient diagnosis, prognosis, drug discovery, but also uh, to serve as an assistant to, to help doctors and provide a better and more uh, personalized uh, experience for patients. The quality of life is what drives Wuxi to keep pushing forward. In line with the government's efforts, it's joining other Chinese cities like Beijing, Chongqing, Wuhan and Shenzhen to provide stress-free driving for its residents. I put it to the test. I'm testing an autonomous vehicle. Let's see how ready it is. I see a pedestrian coming. Ooh, not bad. It has avoided the pedestrian. The biggest challenge is safety. Rigorous tests are conducted at this test site in Wuxi. From robotics to medical services and autonomous driving, AI is not a buzzword anymore. It's making its way into processes and changing the way we live. But ethical guidelines and regulations have yet to catch up with AI. Wuxi has set a target of 2030. It wants to create a modern industrial system with new quality productive forces. A future that's already on the horizon. That was Erika Sturia Manikam in Wuxi, Jiangsu Province. Coming up, the U.S. president has ended his re-election campaign. Dive into news like never before with Deep Dive, the podcast from CGTN Radio. Join our global reporters for captivating stories and thought-provoking conversations. Search Deep Dive on your favorite podcast platforms and get ready to dive in. We're at 14 minutes past the hour. U.S. President Joe Biden's ended his re-election campaign. It follows weeks of calls from within the Democratic Party for Biden to step aside after his debate against Donald Trump last month raised worries about his age and mental acuity. Poppy Imputing has details from Washington. U.S. President Joe Biden has ended his run for the presidency. Sharing the news via social media on Sunday, he wrote, It has been the greatest honor of my life to serve as your president. 
and while it has been my intention to seek re-election, I believe it is in the best interest of my party and the country for me to stand down and to focus solely on fulfilling my duties as president for the remainder of my term. Shortly after announcing his withdrawal Sunday, Biden endorsed his presidential running mate and U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris to be the new Democratic nominee. She wrote on social media, I am honored to have the president's endorsement and my intention is to earn and win this nomination. Reactions from top Democrats were swift, including House Majority Speaker Chuck Schumer, who wrote, Joe Biden has not only been a great president and a great legislative leader, but he's a truly amazing human being. Former President Barack Obama, under whom Biden served as vice president for eight years, said, Michelle and I just want to express our love and gratitude to Joe and Jill for leading us so ably and courageously during these perilous times and for their commitment to the ideals of freedom and equality that this country was founded on. Reaction among ordinary Americans is mixed. He has listened to the American people and he has done what is best for his party and his country. And I think it's one of the most selfless, admirable things you can do. If you want to push somebody out, give me back a person who you think that should be a good candidate to run against Trump. They never gave that, that information. And that's what's disappointing with me. Republicans also reacted, calling on Biden to resign as president immediately. Pressure had been mounting on Biden from within his own party, mostly behind closed doors, but also publicly to quit his re-election bid, following a disastrous presidential debate with Donald Trump last month. During the debate, he had memory lapses and rambled at times, causing concern that he was cognitively unfit. In the days and weeks that followed, Biden hit the campaign trail, adamant that he was fighting fit and committed to staying in the race. He also went on a media blitz designed to show that his debate performance was little more than a bad night, as the president had repeated to the American people. But he continued to make more comments that concerned viewers and voters in subsequent days while deflecting questioning and critiques about his mental acuity. With donors tightening the purse strings and polls showing Biden trailing Trump, by Sunday at least 35 Democratic lawmakers had publicly called for Biden to pass the torch. Biden is expected to address the nation within the coming week. Harris, meanwhile, has less than four months to appeal to members within her party to back her and the American people to carry her to presidential victory come November. That was Poppy imputing on Joe Biden's decision to quit the U.S. presidential election. Yemen's Houthi group says Israeli strikes on Hodeidah portal not benefit Israel. On Sunday, Israel shot down a missile launched from Yemen, targeting the southern resort city of Eilat. Meantime, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu travels to Washington on Monday to meet U.S. President Joe Biden amid growing tensions in the Middle East. Jonathan Regev has more from Tel Aviv. A missile that was intercepted, fired from Yemen. This is far from surprising. No one here in Israel was under the illusion that uh, following that Israeli strike in the port of Hodeida on a Saturday afternoon, the attacks from Yemen uh, will stop. The Houthis vowed to keep on uh, pushing maybe even more than they did before. And there was a, a, that, that uh, missile that was fired towards Eilat and uh, was uh, intercepted. Uh, this, is, this will probably be uh, more and more of what we will see now, uh, attempts from uh, Yemen and also from other Iranian proxies in the region, maybe in uh, Iraq or so, to fire uh, missiles, to fire UAVs towards uh, Israel. The assumption here is that we will see more and more of them as the war in Gaza is constantly ongoing. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu will take off for uh, Washington on, on Monday morning and uh, he's uh, set to meet uh, President Biden on Tuesday uh, afternoon, once in the U.S. And of course, when he meets uh, President Biden, and Netanyahu will be surely under a lot of pressure to move on with that uh, hostage deal. The Americans uh, are, are eager to see that uh, deal uh, coming to fruition. We also heard Secretary of State Antony Blinken saying uh, over the weekend that he believes that the agreement is uh, closed. But uh, while that will be the 
pressure in the U.S. Here in Israel, uh, Netanyahu is under pressure from his uh, far-right uh, uh, members of coalition, mainly Tamar Ben-Gvir and Bezalel Smotrich, both of them saying they will not be a part of any government that will support such a hostage deal, meaning that approving the deal will put the coalition under danger. How will Benjamin Netanyahu play around all of these different pressures? We'll have to wait and see a lot of pressure on the Israeli prime minister. That was Jonathan Regev on the Israeli prime minister's trip to Washington as regional hostilities are showing no signs of abating. The Supreme Court in Bangladesh has scrapped most quotas on government jobs after violent nationwide clashes killed at least 139 people. The quotas included reserving 30 percent of government jobs for the families of those who fought for independence from Pakistan. The Supreme Court ruled that 93 percent of government jobs should now be open to candidates on merit. Some protest organizers say they'll continue demonstrations until authorities release detained student leaders and restore internet and cellular services. DAC is now relatively calm after soldiers began patrols late on Friday to enforce a government curfew. The clashes have injured thousands across the country in recent days, as police use tear gas, rubber bullets, and sound grenades to disperse protesters. Coming up, Paris Olympic organizers say that the French capital is ready to host the Summer Games. Discover the realities and responses to our changing climate with Climate Watch. Uncover critical issues such as the Maasai Mara's disrupted wildebeest migration and the drop in the Panama Canal's water levels. Delve into solutions for a sustainable future. Tune in to Climate Watch on your favorite podcast platform. Become more eco-conscious and take action to protect our planet. We're at 21 minutes past the hour. The president of the Paris 2024 organizing committee said the city's ready for the games as he played down complaints from residents and businesses about the impact of the event. They've closed roads leading to the River Seine, where the opening ceremony will take place. Organizing committee president Tony Essinghe says the government plans to deploy 45,000 security personnel for the ceremony. That's a balance to be found uh, between uh, uh, a perfect security, which is absolutely the priority, and there is no discussion, there has never been any discussion uh, to put at risk uh, a security model. So the base is how we can guarantee the security uh, for the spectators and, and for the athletes. France is a country famous for its bread, wine, meat, and cheese. The Paris organizers have pledged an environmentally friendly games, and that applies as well to the food served at the athletes' village. Ross Cullen reports. Picking fruit by hand is delicate work. Farm laborers are not working on a regular harvest because small berries have an Olympic future, destined for the restaurants of the Paris 2024 athletes' village. We at Fruy Rouge are very proud to be a partner of the Olympics, to be able to supply the athletes and bring them fine, local, French produce. I've adapted for the fruit they want. I changed my harvest with more or less mature berries, the size of the fruit, to adapt to what's been asked of me to provide for the Games. The raspberries are grown a short drive north of the French capital part of an ambition for the Games to reduce food miles and eat French produce from small farms. Environmental concerns are a key part of the food strategy of Paris 2024, and the raspberries here are organic, pesticide-free. This is where the fruit will end up, in what will be this summer the world's biggest restaurant complex, feeding and fueling 15,000 Olympic athletes. There will be two dining halls dedicated to French gastronomy, among other offerings for competitors with a different taste. Of course, we have our culinary heritage, but there will be 206 delegations coming who we will welcome to our table. It's important for us that each athlete performs to the highest level, and to do that, we must respect their dietary needs. One of the major partners for the Games is the Carrefour supermarket group, one of the world's biggest retailers. The group has been working hard to align its green targets, its role in the Games and place on the world stage. 
It is certainly possible to have the ambition to be both a partner of a global event and to be engaged with the green transition and the food transition. So with everything we have in place and that we will put in place, we can inspire others to be part of the beautiful heritage that we will leave after the 8th September and the closing ceremony for the Paris 2024 Games. Over the coming weeks, hundreds of thousands of athletes, dignitaries and fans will feast on the world's most famous cuisine, from the grand dishes of Michelin-starred restaurants down to little red fruits from family farms. And that was Ross Cullen reporting. Uh, eventing rider Alex Watian will compete at the Olympics for the fourth time in Paris after previously appearing in Beijing, Rio, and Tokyo. He won China's first Asian Games equestrian golds last year in Hangzhou. Craig Lafredi spoke with a 34-year-old about his expectations for this year's Games as well as the future of his sport in China. How do you feel heading into what will be your fourth Olympics? It's very, very exciting. Paris has obviously been a big target for me and my team over the past four years, the prime target, as it were. But at this stage of the game, just weeks away, you never really have time to really, uh, really feel like you, you get to enjoy it until you get there. I'm hoping, you know, once we travel to Paris, the horse settles into Versailles and the event got, gets going, that's, that's the time to sit back and, and enjoy and uh, focus. What are your expectations for yourself? I've always been very good at managing my expectations. I think with horses, all you can expect is to do your best. And if your best on the day is is better than everybody else, then that's amazing. (laughs) But other than that, there's not much else you can do about it. And horses bring so many different millions of unknown factors into the mix. It very much keeps you on your toes. You have to be very clear in your vision of what you want to do and what you want to achieve, but you have to at the same time feel what's happening underneath you and make decisions according to how your horse feels. And that's so intangible sometimes. It's it's impossible at this stage, even two weeks out, to forecast what might or might not happen. So many things can go right, so many things can go wrong. You know, but having said that, I I do have such an exciting team of horses. The three horses that qualified, Chox, Chico, Stig, they are all super, super horses. They can all they could on the right day if the stars all align deliver very exciting results. So I think we just have to wait and see what happens. Now, Alex, you first competed for China at the Olympics in Beijing 2008. Your career has really sort of paralleled the growth of Chinese equestrianism. Can you talk a little bit about that, the growth of the sport here, um, what you've done to help foster that, and just the state of it right now? Chinese equestrianism has grown an unbelievable amount since Beijing 2008. I think Beijing 2008 for China was a key moment for the whole country, not only for Chinese equestrianism. And as part of that, Chinese equestrianism very much caught some of the limelight from the Beijing Olympics. It was a new sport. I think equestrianism has a very aspirational appeal. And I think that with the rapid growth of the middle class in China, I think there is a lot of opportunity for equestrian sports to be a part of many more people's lives at home in China. That was uh, Greg Lafrady speaking with eventing rider Alex Hua Tian about the upcoming Olympic Games and his sport. We're at 28 minutes past the hour, checking the forecast ahead of the break, and Beijing's down to 26 degrees on Monday evening. Tuesday, cloudy and 34 in Shanxi. Uh, Shengluo is 23 tonight. Uh, tomorrow we'll have a, a slight rainfall in 34. Nanchang's at 30 this evening, then sunny in 39. In Sichuan province, uh, Ya'an is 24 this evening, followed by heavy rainfall in 32. Elsewhere in Asia, Islamabad's 26 this evening. Tuesday, a slight rain in 34. Vientiane's down to 26 degrees then some rain and 33. Phnom Penh's at 25 overnight, a slight rain and 32 tomorrow. In Africa, Nairobi is getting a slight rain with a high of 25 degrees on Tuesday. Kampala's at 20 overnight, then a slight rain and 24. Juba's 22 this evening, then some rain and 31. Finally to Oceania, Port Vila's 24 this evening, followed by a slight rainfall and 27 degrees Celsius. It's time for a short break. So far this hour, CPC General Secretary Xi Jinping's explained the importance of a crucial resolution on reform the country's opening up and modernization, and U.S. President Joe Biden's ended his re-election campaign following pressure from within his own party. The head of the Paris 2024 Olympic Committee says the French capital is ready to host the Games. Shane Bigham with you. Stay with us here on the Beijing Hour. 
experience the musical classics of the East. Mingle with the masters of Chinese music. Music talks. Witness the sound of antiquity and modernity. We all enter this world with a universal greeting. We then learn to speak. Though our languages, cultures, and traditions may differ, we still share one thing in common. We have hope for humanity and the world. An General Railway Company Deutsche Director of the International the Monetary Fund, United Nations Climate. Hear the difference with CGTN Radio. Join our global network to connect with the world. CGTN Radio. Hear the difference. I love you. 我爱你 This might be the easiest way to say I love you, since there are so many other romantic expressions. No matter if you're a rookie, 你好，我的中文一点点 or a sophisticated learner, 我来北京五年了，我是本地人 There is definitely something that will interest you. Check out Takeaway Chinese, a world that starts with 你好 Examining the events that impact and shape China and the rest of the world. This is the Beijing Hour. One hour of news and information brought to you every weekday. Now here's your host, Shane Begum, with you on this Monday. Still to come. In business, China plans further improvements for the digital economy. In sports, Chinese tennis ace Zhang Qinwen has taken the title in Italy. In culture and entertainment, the 2024 Beijing International Beverage Festival is underway. Contact us. You can email radio at cgtn dot com or follow our X account, formerly Twitter, at cgtn radio. First of all, checking the day's headline news. Here's Wang Zhang. Thank you, Shane. China has released a key document to explain its plans for reform and modernization following a crucial meeting of the Communist Party of China in Beijing. At the recent third plenary session, the 20th CPC Central Committee adopted the resolution on further deepening reform comprehensively to advance Chinese modernization. The got document says opening up is a defining feature of Chinese modernization. To achieve this, China will remain committed to its reform and opening up. Strategy and refine its foreign trade structure. China will also reform its management systems for inward and outward investment. The resolution states that China aims to advance its ecological civilization reforms and achieve harmony between humanity and nature. The government will enhance its ecological framework and governance to build an environmentally friendly and sustainable economy, paving the way for carbon neutrality. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi has met a delegation of the U.S.-China Business Council in Beijing. He stressed the importance of China-U.S. relations to the world. Wang Yi also expressed hope that the U.S. business community will continue to move forward with China. He said he believes this will not only benefit U.S. entrepreneurs but also strengthen China-U.S. relations and the friendship between the two peoples. The U.S. business community expressed confidence in the Chinese market. They said they look forward to further deepening cooperation and remain committed to building a strong and balanced China-U.S. relationship. The Chinese Foreign Ministry has announced that the Ukrainian Foreign Minister will visit China from Tuesday to Friday. Dmitry Kuleba's trip comes at the invitation of Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi. A Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson says China has reached a provisional arrangement with the Philippines on managing the situation at Renai Jiao Reef in the South China Sea. The spokesperson stressed that Renai Jiao is part of China's Nansha Islands, and China has sovereignty over the area as well as the adjacent waters. The provisional arrangement was reached on the basis of China's principled position. First, China said the Philippines' warships grounded at Renai Jiao Reef over the past few decades is a violation of China's sovereignty and a declaration of the conduct of parties in the South China Sea. China continues to demand the Philippines tow away the ship. Second, before the warship is towed away, China will allow the Philippines to send living necessities to personnel living on board if the Philippines inform. 
informs China in advance and after on-site verification is conducted. Third, if the Philippines were to send construction materials to the warship and attempt to build fixed facilities or permanent outposts, China will stop it in accordance with laws and regulations to uphold China's sovereignty. Typhoon Praparun has made landfall in Hainan province. The state flood control and drought relief headquarters has sent a work team to the southern Chinese island to help with relief work. Authorities have suspended high-speed rail services circling the island and ferry operations across the Chungzhou Strait. They've also advised sailing vessels to take shelter. Hainan and the Beibu Gulf are embracing for strong winds and heavy rains. Thousands of anti-tourism activists have marched in Spain in the latest demonstration against a key industry for the Iberian nation. They have staged a series of protests this year in Barcelona and other popular holiday destinations, including Mallorca. They say visitors are driving up housing costs and residents can no longer afford to live in city centers. Taxi driver Alvaro Sanchez says they are against the tourism model. We are not against tourist research, but we are against the, the touristic model, which is kind of a part of ca- the capitalist model. And we are suffering the consequences of this model because we cannot afford living here. And that's because uh, tourists with high standards of living, they come here and they hire our standards of living also. Data in the first quarter shows that over 16 million people visited Spain, an increase of 18% compared with the same period last year. And finally, authorities in Greenland have arrived a prominent anti-whaling environmentalist and under an international arrest warrant issued by Japan. 73-year-old Paul Watson is known for high seas confrontations with whaling vessels. Authorities detained Watson when his ship docked for refueling en route to intercept a Japanese whaling ship in the North Pacific. The Captain Paul Watson Foundation believes the arrest is related to previous anti-whaling interventions in the Antarctic region and has called for Watson's release. The police say he might be extradited to Japan. All right, thank you very much. That was Wang Zihang with headline news. This is Shane Bigham in the Chinese capital. Coming up in business, China plans further improvements for the digital economy. The Beijing Hour, your window on China and the rest of the world. 37 minutes past the hour now, turning to business and starting with the markets. Chinese mainland markets closed lower on Monday. The Shanghai Composite dropped six-tenths of a percent. The Shenzhen Component lost four-tenths. Energy stocks, including PetroChina, led the decliners on weaker oil prices. In Hong Kong, the Hang Seng Index surged 1.3 percent. In Japan, the Nikkei was down 1.2 percent. China will foster a more enabling climate for the development of the digital economy. The National Data Bureau says efforts will be made to improve data infrastructure and institutional systems and promote market-oriented allocation of data resources. It says it will focus on integrating digital technologies with the real economy. The rapid development of China's digital industries came on the back of robust digital infrastructure. Recent figures show that the country had over 3.8 million 5G base stations by the end of May, and that accounted for 60% of the global total. People's Bank of China has cut its benchmark loan prime rate to shore up the economy. The one-year rate came in at 3.35%, down 10 basis points. The over five-year rate dropped by the same amount, sinking to 3.85%. On Monday, the central bank cut its seven-day reverse repo rate from 1.8% to 1.7%, further loosening monetary conditions in the country. The bank conducted around $8.2 billion U.S. billion of seven-day reverse repos at an interest rate of 1.7%. For more on the monetary policy, Zhang Junfeng spoke with Professor Wang Yaojing from Peking University. How significant it is to for the rate cuts a move as by China's central bank? Uh, so China's central bank has lowered mortgage rates for new home purchases earlier this year, and this reduction in the LPR will further lower mortgage costs for existing loans, which will play a positive role in consolidating the real estate market. Um, and also stimulate demand. So the decrease in LPR also helps reduce financing costs for the real economy, encouraging investment and consumption since households save interest costs, thereby uh, supporting the macroeconomic stability. However, there are concerns that the uh, narrowing net interest margins would affect 
bank's ability to maintain a stable profit level. Uh, it is anticipated that major state-owned banks will consider lowering deposit rates, which uh, small and medium-sized banks will likely to follow, and thus stabilizing the overall net interest margins in the banking sector and ensuring the smooth flow of financial operations. Now, the recently concluded key meeting said the tax and fiscal policies are set to face fundamental reform to facilitate the real estate new growth model. So what fiscal system reform can we expect? Well, the old estate uh, growth model stemmed from land finance, where local government rely heavily on selling land to raise income. Therefore, the real estate new growth model would be expected to include new sources of income, uh, especially tax income for local government. And there are taxes that are particularly suitable for local governments to collect rather than the central government. Uh, for example, consumption tax can be collected at the local level. Also, uh, new transfer payment schemes can be effective ways to balance between provinces. And although we do not know the exact details of physical system reform yet, but we will, would expect the direction of the reform is towards local governments being self-sufficient as much as possible in terms of income and expenditure obligations. That was uh, Professor Wang Yaojing with Peking University. China Securities Regulatory Commission suspended securities relending starting from Monday. Existing securities relending contracts can be extended, but they should be settled before the end of September. The securities watchdog also raised the margin requirements for short selling activities from a minimum of 80% to 100%, while the margin requirements for private equity funds are raised from a minimum of 100% to 120%. The move aims to maintain the stability of the market. Foreign investors increased holdings of Chinese bonds in June for a 10th consecutive month. The amount hit a new high of roughly 593 billion U.S. dollars. Foreign financial institutions also expanded their presence in China's interbank bond market. As of the end of June, over 1,100 foreign entities had entered the market. China launched the Bond Connect program in 2017 to make the Chinese mainland's interbank bond market accessible to overseas investors and international national bond markets for mainland investors. China will launch an expiry review of anti-dumping measures on stainless steel imports from the EU, the UK, South Korea, and Indonesia. China imposed anti-dumping duties in 2019, with rates ranging from 18.1 to 103.1 percent for five years. Chinese electric vehicle maker Xpeng and German automaker Volkswagen have jointly established a number of project houses for engineers. The new establishments are warehouses for engineers from both parties to work together. The warehouses are aimed at helping the parties begin production for jointly developed architecture such as modules and networks within a vehicle. Xpeng and Volkswagen forged a partnership last year when Volkswagen bought around 5% of Xpeng for around 700 million US dollars. The two sides plan to launch two Volkswagen-branded EV models in the next two years. Many China, uh, Chinese financial institutions have ramped up support for science and technology enterprises. Suzhou Capital Group is a state-owned enterprise focusing on full-cycle technology investment in various sectors in Jiangsu province. In the first half of the year, the group has invested in over 30 early-stage projects. Vice President Zhu Wei says uh, these projects accounted for over 60% of its overall project portfolio. These companies are in desperate need of support in equity investment and industrial ecology. They also need assistance in both funds and the industrial chain. In the meantime, authorities in Suzhou have been staging numerous business events this year to offer financial help for tech startups. Cao Ye with Suzhou Financial Services Office says such efforts have boosted high-quality development. We are committed to building a better financial ecosystem so that all types of enterprises can obtain relatively high-quality financial products and services throughout their life cycles, encouraging them to undertake research and development, expand production, and invest more. Over 5,000 projects focusing on industries such as new energy, the low-altitude economy, and integrated circuits have settled in Suzhou in the first half of the year. 
Engaging in a side hustle continues to be a big trend this year in the U.S., with more than one in three Americans finding another way to generate income apart from their day job. A one side gig growing in popularity is investing and in reselling collectibles like uh, Lego, uh, with some entrepreneurs saying that they make six figure returns. Karina Mitchell has more. It was a sweet moment for toy enthusiasts and industry experts as they gathered at Toy Insider's annual toy preview event in New York City. The epic play date featured interactive stations, favorite classics, as well as previewing gadgets, games and gizmos sure to make it onto every kid's wish list. But it's not just the little ones who have their eyes focused on some of their favorite things. Toys like Lego aren't just popular with young kids, they can also be a lucrative investment for adults who know what to look for. Over the past few years, we've seen a huge upswing in adult collectors and enthusiasts for toys. James Zahn has been involved in the toy industry for decades. He says Lego has seen a surge in interest from collectors and resellers. So we're talking sets for the 18 and older market that are elaborate with thousands of pieces and they come with a premium price tag. And this is leading to some interesting phenomena. Not only are folks building these, they're keeping them. They're speculating that years from now, they could be worth 10 times what they paid for them. Social media is full of speculators like this. They've been able to translate side hustles that involve small investments into sought-after Lego sets and turn them into huge returns totaling thousands of dollars. According to a recent survey from Bankrate, more than one in three Americans, 36 percent, engage in some sort of side hustle to bring in some extra cash amid still elevated inflation and a high rate environment. Last year, the average side hustler made about eight hundred and ten dollars a month, and now it's about nine hundred. That's a lot of progress in one year. Indicating investing in a hot new trend today that also provides hours of fun may lead to a business that becomes a real money maker. This can be a way to explore a passion project and build some new skills and experience and meet people. But both Rossman and Zahn agree that return on investment should be the only reason to take on a side gig, whether it's reselling collectibles like Lego or something else. That was Karina Mitchell reporting. You're listening to the Beijing Hour. Coming up in sports, Chinese tennis ace Zheng Qinwen has taken the title in Italy. Welcome to Journey to Paris, a quick dive into the captivating elements of the upcoming sporting extravaganza in the French capital. Today we're diving into the most exciting venues for the Paris 2024 Summer Olympics. Let's explore where the action will unfold. First up, the start of the France in Saint-Denis. This iconic stadium will host the opening and closing ceremonies, as well as track and field events. With a capacity of over 80,000, it promises a vibrant atmosphere. Next, the Grand Palais, a historic site in the heart of Paris, will transform into a venue for fencing in the Taekwondo. Its stunning glass-domed roof will provide a unique backdrop for these intense competitions. The Roland Garros Stadium, famous for the French Open, will host tennis matches. Athletes will compete on its renowned clay courts, adding a layer of history to the games. Over at the Champ de Mars, beneath the Eiffel Tower, beach volleyball will take center stage. This picturesque location will offer breathtaking views and unforgettable matches. Lastly, let's not forget La Seine River, where open water swimming and triathlon events will take place. This iconic river will provide a scenic and challenging course for athletes. Paris 2024 is set to blend history, beauty and modernity, creating unforgettable experiences for athletes and spectators alike. Stay tuned for more updates on this exciting event. 48 minutes past the hour. Turning to sports now, and here's Brandon Yates. Thank you, Shane. China's Zhang Qinwen has claimed the 35 Palermo Ladies Open title. I want to say I'm really happy to come back here in this tournament in Palermo. It's really, really special place for me. 
it's my third year here and second title. There's nothing can describe my feeling. I don't know if this tournament is gonna continue next year. I wish so because I really love here. It's really special for me. Zhang defeated Karolina Muchova in three sets to lift her second title. Paris 2024 President Tony Estangue is feeling confident ahead of the Olympics opening ceremony. We are very confident now with the opening ceremony because we know precisely the forecast. All the predictions are, are very positive uh, for the weather on, on Friday, next Friday. So you can be confident it will be a, a great moment of celebration. The River Seine spectacle gets underway on Friday. Zander Shawfly claimed an impressive two-shot win at the 152nd Open on Sunday. I had a, some feeling of calmness come through and it was very helpful on what is what has been one of the hardest back nines I've ever played in a tournament. So it's uh, it really, I mean, it's a dream come true to be a, to win two majors in one year. The reigning PGA champion closed out a stunning bogey-free 65 to finish on nine under, seeing him finish two clear of playing partner Justin Rose. Tadej Pogacar has secured the Tour de France title. I'm super happy. Uh, I cannot uh, describe how happy I am uh, after uh, yeah uh, two two hard years in the Tour de France. Always some mistakes, and uh, this year everything to perfection. The win sees Pogacar secure his third title in the world's biggest cycling race. Table toppers Shanghai SIPG thrashed Qingdao Zhou Noon 5-0 in the Chinese Super League on Sunday. Back in the capital, Beijing Gowan defeated Tianjin Teda 2-0. Elsewhere, Qingdao West Coast and Meizhou Hakka drew 3-3. Shandong Luneng earned a 2-0 win against Nantong Ji Yun. Henan Jianye edged Hangzhou, Hangzhou Greentown 2-1. And Shenzhen Shinpeng Cheng beat Changchun Yatai 2-1. Oscar Piastri has won a highly dramatic and controversial Hungarian Grand Prix for his first full win in Formula One. The win came after teammate Lando Norris eventually heeded pleading messages from the McLaren pit wall to cede a lead he had inherited through their pit stop strategy. In a gripping and increasingly contentious 70-lap race, old rivals Lewis Hamilton and Max Verstappen also collided late on in a scrap over third place. Hamilton eventually sealed third, with championship leader Verstappen, Verstappen having to settle for fifth. China's Zhou Guan Yu finished in 19th place. And finally, Judd Trump has won his first snooker Shanghai Masters title, beating fellow Englishman Sean Murphy 11-5 in the final. The world number two, who thrashed seven-time world champion Ronnie O'Sullivan in the semi-finals, was in scintillating form, scoring three centuries as he took the prize. Trump, who led 7-3 after the morning session, put himself within a frame of the title with a break of 110, his 10th century of the tournament. Murphy responded with two centuries to close the gap to 10-5 before Trump sealed his first title of the 2024-25 season. All right, thank you very much. That was Brandon Yates with Sports. Coming up in culture and entertainment, the 2024 Beijing International Beverage Festival is underway. <laughs> Ever wondered what's actually going on in Africa through the perspective of an African? How are things really going between China and Africa? What's the narrative of this relationship? Well, get a perspective with China Africa Talk. Hear from African diplomats, entrepreneurs, academics, Chinese natives, and more. Get on our wavelength every week to find out what's real with China Africa Talk. Find us on your favorite podcast. We'll see you there. 53 minutes past the hour. Turning to culture and entertainment now, here's Yang Guang. Thank you, Shane. The 2024 Beijing International Beverage Festival has kicked off at Longtan Junhu Park in Dongcheng District. The festival will last until the end of August, covering areas across the city. Beverage and food markets will be a highlight as well as nighttime beverage markets. Throughout ongoing festival, several online and in-store promotions will also take place to entice potential customers. More than 50 trendy beverage brands and over 7,000 stores will be part of this ongoing festival. Decades of digs at China's porcelain production capital in the country's south have seen the revival of a former imperial kiln. 
Many of these discovered and restored artifacts are now on display at museums across China. Ling Ling has the story. Taoyang Li Historic Zone is one of the best preserved cultural districts in Jingdezhen, renowned as China's porcelain capital. Years of restoration work have rejuvenated this area, breathing new life into ancient streets and old kiln sites. These revitalized spaces tell the legendary story of Jingdezhen. This site contains the remnants of the imperial kilns from the Ming and Qing dynasties. Established in 1369, the Imperial Kiln Factory attracted the most skilled artisans from across the country, using the best local and imported materials to achieve the highest level of ceramic craftsmanship. During the Ming and Qing dynasties, nearly all innovative ceramic technologies emerged from the Imperial Kiln, which produced the finest porcelain wares. Research indicates that more than 90% of the 376,000 ceramic artifacts in the Palace Museum collections were made here. Over the years, archaeological excavations have uncovered more than 10 million porcelain fragments dating back to different periods of the Ming and Qing dynasties. These remnants are now preserved as specimens added to Jingdezhen's ancient ceramic collections. Or restored into intact ceramics displayed at the Jingdezhen Imperial Kiln Museum. In the Ming and Qing dynasties, producing fine porcelain at the Imperial Kiln involved complex procedures. To maintain stringent quality standards and technical confidentiality, any porcelain with the slightest flaw was smashed and buried on site to prevent it from reaching the public. Only perfect pieces were sent to the Forbidden City. To date, over 3,000 items of various shapes and glazes have been repaired. Additionally, 200 to 300 new items are restored each year. These reconstructed pieces, made from fragments, bring to light porcelain that was once discarded and buried, gradually piecing together the former grandeur of the thousand-year porcelain capital. That was Lin Lin reporting. A pair of round blue tinted glasses given by John Lennon to a man visiting Abbey Road Studios are to go on sale. The John Lennon-style glasses, which were gifted in 1968, are expected to fetch up to 3,000 British pounds. A collection of photographs taken at the famous music recording studios are also for sale. They include some snapped on the day of the photo shoot for the Abbey Road album cover of the band walking across a zebra crossing. The items will be auctioned on July 31st. First at Farley Golf Club in Surrey, England. The collection of 33 black and white photographs taken at Abbey Road includes rare images of Paul McCartney, George Harrison, George Martin, and Ringo Starr. And finally, the Beijing Central Axis is now pursuing world heritage status. The Central Axis is a line of historic and cultural landmarks that runs through the heart city of、um, Chinese capital. Originating in the Yuan Dynasty, this axis extends around eight kilometers from Yongding Gate in the south to the Drum and Bell Towers in the north. The World Heritage Committee will consider this nomination during its ongoing session, which concludes on July 31st in New Delhi, India. Efforts to have the Beijing Central Axis designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site began in 2011. Since then, China has carried out over 100 cultural heritage restoration projects along the axis. In early 2023, Beijing submitted the nomination dossier to the UNESCO World Heritage Center, aiming for a successful inscription at the 2024 session. That's 11 years ahead of the initial target date of 2035. As a key cultural and historical symbol of China, the Central Axis continues to draw tourists eager to explore the ancient city's historic sites and learn about its rich heritage. All right, thank you very much. That was Yang Guang with Culture and Entertainment. Checking the forecast before we go for the day, and Beijing's down to 26 degrees on Monday evening. Tuesday will be cloudy, 34. In Shanxi Province,、uh, Shenghua is 23 this evening. Then a slight rainfall in 34 degrees. Nanchang's down to 30, then sunny in 39. In Sichuan Province, Yan'an's at 24 overnight. Tomorrow, a heavy rainfall in 32.
Elsewhere in Asia, uh, Islamabad is down 26 this evening. Tuesday is getting a slight rainfall in 34. Vientiane's at 26 overnight, then a slight rain in 33. Phnom Penh's down to 25 degrees, then a slight rain in 32. And that's all the time we have for this edition of the Beijing Hour. Making news today, CPC General Secretary Xi Jinping has explained the importance of a crucial resolution on reform for the country's opening up and modernization. On behalf of the staff, this is Shane Bigham in the Chinese capital, hoping you'll join us for the next edition of the Beijing Hour and open a window to the world together. Take away Chinese, where you can take some Chinese away and experience progress day by day. Take away Chinese, we will promise you a difference. Hello everybody, welcome to Roundtable, coming to you live from Beijing. From Beijing. Roundtable. 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 Connecting China and the world. We bring you fun and timely discussions about what's affecting our lives everywhere, every day. Tune in to Roundtable, where the East meets the West, and understanding is the goal. From North to South, East to West, people in China are chasing their dreams and leaving their mark. Want to know how they beat the odds and made a difference? Footprints brings you the true life stories of their journeys. 